Welcome to another episode of Arbitration Life. I am Janet Brin. And I'm Hannah Dumas. Caribbean countries have been involved in a number of investor state cases in recent years, including Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Cuba, Dominica, the Dominican Republic, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Trinidad and Tobago. At the BVI IAC, we can now administer investment disputes. Absolutely. And there are other institutions that actually are known for administering investor state cases. I think the cases you mentioned earlier um, involving Caribbean countries were probably mostly uh, ad hoc cases. Okay. Uh, the one of this institution is ICFID, which is extremely known for doing investor state, um, administering investor state cases. And we are very lucky to have a cooperation agreement with ICFID, which is one of the five institutions from the World Bank Group. Today's guest is one of the two sec Deputy Secretary General of ICFID. She joined ICFID in sep September 2001, and she has served as Tribunal Secretary in over 50 arbitrations. Prior to joining ICSID, she wor worked as an attorney in Paris and in Prague. She studied in the US, in France, and in Sweden, and she is admitted to practice in Washington, DC. She speaks English, French, Czech, and Swedish. And I had the pleasure to meet her and work with her in 2017 while I was doing my uh, externship at ICSID in DC. Please welcome Martina Polasek. Hello, Martina. Welcome to Arbitration Live. How are you? Thank you so much. How are you? And thank you for having me. This is a great initiative. Thank you so much, Martina. I mean, we good. Yeah, yeah. How things in D.C., my old stomping grounds. I'm a Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area girl. Mm -hmm. ah, <laughs> it's very hot and humid presently, uh, but things are pretty much back to normal. So, um, we have baseball games going on and, uh, right. you know, uh, restaurants are open for business. Uh, it feels pretty good. I'm still sitting at home. Uh, we're still at the home base work uh, in, for, at the World Bank, uh, but it's slowly going back also to the office. Good, good. That's good to hear. Uh, same weather here. It's been raining a little bit. I don't think it's not as humid as DC. I know for sure, but... Uh, I mean, it's the Caribbean, the hurricane season. Um, well, I'm looking forward to going, hopefully without any hurricanes, um, to the Bahamas next week. Oh, sweet. Oh, nice. For a little vacation? Yes, indeed. Um, scuba diving vacation for a week. Wonderful. So great. Okay, so I'm going to ask our first question, Martina. Could you please tell us more about your role as Deputy Secretary? Secretary General at ICSID? Well, uh, I must say I've been at ICSID now for almost exactly 20 years. And so my role- Congratulations. Has, yes, yes, I started in August uh, uh, 2001, which was, as, as you know, a turbulent year. Um, so my role has kind of shifted and evolved uh, over time. I started as a council, then a senior counsel and team leader uh, in, in charge of one of the case management teams. And then I became a deputy in 2016. And so as, you know, as deputy, I'm part of the exit management team and I assist the secretary general with uh, matters that are both case related and others. Uh, so for the case related matters, we look at uh, appointments to tribunals, uh, procedural issues in cases that that are somehow difficult or novel, and you'd be surprised. There are, you know, once you think you've seen it all, something new happens. And That's I've great. never had a boring day in my life at at Exit during those twenty years. Wow. Um, we also look at disqualifications. Um, of arbitrators, especially when the decision is to be taken by exit as opposed to the other tribunal members. And then for the non-case related matters, um, hiring of new staff, 
uh, ICSID's internship program. Um, I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Uh, internal policies, cooperation with other arbitration institutions. Um, so uh, as we're doing now. And, and like uh, how we do have a cooperation agreement actually. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And projects such as the code of conduct uh, that we're working on together with UNCITRAL and the ICSID rule amendments, uh, trainings and outreach activities. And, and then I do still act as secretary of, of, of tribunals. Oh, uh, you do? I do. Uh, wow. All of our lawyers, except Meg, uh, mm -hmm. who's secretary general, uh, work on cases uh, and um, I find that still a privilege. I never get bored of that. And it's really good to be in touch with case management to understand arbitrators and council positions um, and the development of investment law. So uh, it's, it's not a nine to find job, <laughs> but it's a very interesting one. That's wonderful. Martina. In your experience, is there an increase in, in an, an increase of investor state arbitrations involving Caribbean countries in particular? Well, you know, it's very interesting that we've had fairly few cases involving Caribbean uh, states as uh, respondents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it, but We've had 13 cases in total throughout uh, ICSID's 50 year history. And I think uh, about 30% uh, from 2011 to, 20, uh, to now. So mm -hmm. we have three cases pending. Uh, and, and, and so it's, it's a fairly low number compared to other regions. Uh, we have two cases against the Dominican Republic right now, uh, one against Grenada, and um, the latest one was also St. Lucia. Um, and I hope it's good news in, in that you're getting a lot of foreign direct investment and yet have no disputes. Um, right. rather than uh, not getting foreign investment. And so there's nothing to have a dispute about, if you see what I mean. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's possible also that um, many, uh, you know, uh, many projects are more commercial projects uh, in, in the region and that you refer to other dispute settlement clauses, more commercial arbitration centers. Absolutely. And actually we're aware of this, like I'm speaking to a few governments that we know that, yeah, usually it's more commercial and, and they go to institutions and not necessarily, so it doesn't become an invested arbitration under the exit rules, for example, and the convention. Uh, but that's very interesting, and we'll be looking very closely to the development of invested arbitrations uh, in the Caribbean region. Yeah, uh, we'd love to follow that. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to ask you, okay, so on the 26th March of 2021, the chairman of ICSID Administrative Council app appointed an all-female ad hoc committee. Uh, and we would love to know more about this important moment in the advanced advancement of diversity in arbitration. It did hit some headlines, didn't it? Uh, yeah, I'm glad it that you heard about it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's, let me first explain a little bit the exit system and why this was so important and remarkable because, um, you know, when you appoint to a nomen committees, ad hoc committees under the exit convention, you have to appoint, or we, the ICSID, have to appoint three persons from the panel of arbitrators. And the panel of arbitrators is basically a list, a roster of arbitrators designated by states. So each state gets to appoint four arbitrators and four conciliators for a certain mandate. And we are confined to that panel. Now, when parties appoint in their cases, they can go outside of that panel. They can choose whomever they want who qualifies. 
Uh, but for us, uh, unless the parties agree otherwise, uh, we have to appoint from that panel and in particular for annulment committees. And so this panel has currently about 260 members and only 20% are women. So about 54, I think it comes to are women, uh, which means that, you know, already from the small pool we have, uh, there's even smaller pool of women. And uh, many of the, the, the designees in general do not have um, arbitration experience, which is really important to parties. So you can, uh, you know, imagine it's really difficult to appoint three members from uh, to any committee, uh, given conflicts of interest, language, um, qualifications, yeah, nationalities, all of that. So, so picking three women <laughs> who were qualified and who were uh, available and didn't have any conflict of interest was really monumental. And I really, I think it really shows uh, it's, its commitment to the diversity agenda. And it's not only about women, of course, it's also about geographic diversity and also allowing newer people into the pool of arbitrators. So we're always on the lookout for young, talented arbitration lawyers who could be potential appointees uh, to tribunals and we've tried to push them forward as well. And we've actually managed to appoint almost 15% of all of our appointments uh, were sort of first timers as we call them. Wow, 15%. Wow, of, that's of the appointments that we made. That's wonderful. That's great to hear, really. Martina, I'm glad you mentioned your interest in young arbitrators. One of the questions we love to ask all our guests is whether or not arbitration chose you or did arbitrate or the other way around. <laughs> I think that was a great question. Um, and I was, I was hesitating because in a way I feel like I'm in control of my own uh, destiny, <laughs> but uh, you never know. And so in the end, I'd say it's about 50, 50. Okay. <laughs> when I was in law school, uh, there were almost no arbitration courses available and definitely no investment arbitration courses available. Uh, I do speak French, so I studied in French, a master uh, in business law, and in that, you know, connection, I wrote a thesis which touched on arbitration, um, and uh, I published a piece of paper, um, a paper that uh, basically landed me an internship in a French law firm, Gentil and Associés, and there were these two arbitration people there who really pulled me in, uh, Bruno Laurent and uh, Nathalie Meyer-Feb. Um, and shortly after that, I got my first position as an associate in the Whiting Case office um, in Prague, because they had an exit case, uh, CSOB, which is a Czech bank, against the Slovak Republic, which is one of the sort of seminal cases. And yeah. I was a very junior lawyer at that time, but I got the, I got to be an expert on exit. <laughs> and, and so that's really how it all started. And, and had I not had that experience, I'm not sure if I would have gotten the, my uh, job at exit. Well, this is wonderful you say that because now I just realized, and I mean, and I mean, we met before when I was uh, doing my externship at Exit, but one of my mentors is also Bruno Laurent. Uh, oh, really? Partner, yeah, at Fully Hog in Paris. And I worked closely with him for three years. He's definitely one of my greatest mentors. So it's, it, it's cool to hear that. You know, it's interesting that you say that. And I'm actually not that surprised because Bruno Laurent has, uh, has sort of propelled the careers of many people in his lifetime. Uh, he definitely has, yeah. Um, now, Martina, what would you say is the greatest achievement of your career? Well, um, I'm very 
proud of the added value that I have brought to the tribunals that I have worked on and as, uh, you know, assisted as a case secretary. Uh, I might have not always agreed with their holdings, <laughs> but I always made sure that uh, they were able to make informed decisions. So uh, basically delivering all the materials and all the uh, background research that I was able to do. Uh, and it's really I've been privileged to be working with really amazing arbitrators and people and rewarding to be contributing to their work. But apart from that, I think the greatest achievement uh, has been my work on the exit rule amendments. And I'm not gonna work because that project is still not over. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you might think, what's so special about rule amendments? Uh, arbitration institutions do that all the time. They amend their rules and they put them out um, to, to their users. But you have to see our rule amendments in the broader context of um, you know, what's going on in the world with investment arbitration. And the fact that ICSID's main stakeholders are the states. You know, we have member states and they're the ones who vote on these things. So the context is that there are these uh, current discussions about reforming investment arbitration, both at ICSID and at UNCITRAL. And these discussions, as you know, are led by states. Uh, among other things, there's a concern that there is a lack of consistency of awards, that the process is too long and too costly, and that arbitrators lack independence and impartiality because they are appointed by the party, so they are inherently biased, or at least that's the perception. Yeah. Now, ICSID has 155 member states. And many of them have strong views on these issues. And uh, many of them have experience with cases and have formed views based on that experience. So there is a great deal of pressure to find solution to fix these problems. And many states are turning to exit to find the solutions and for, you know, to for seek our leadership to, to deal with this. Um, and so um, uh, I can safely say that this has been my greatest challenge to, to work on how to address these issues. And we started this project uh, almost four years ago, so it became a complete overhaul of our rules. Uh, in fact, uh, I think, Hannah, you might have been there at <laughs> still. Oh, yeah. It's a long time ago, but uh, I remember you were there. Yeah, it was in uh, 2017 when I was there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and we really had to uh, think of innovative solutions to new trends in investment arbitration. And this was not always easy because we had to maintain a good balance in the rules because since you have investors uh, on one side, typically as claimant, and states on the other side, uh, typically as respondent, you cannot have provisions that mainly favor the respondent, right? So, so the key is to maintain that balance, and that was proved to be really, really difficult. Um, uh, we had uh, four thick working papers and three consultations with states. Um, and now next week, we're actually issuing our fifth working paper, and we hope that's the last one and that that's the end of it and that we can start using these rules uh, sometime next year. So I knock on wood again, <laughs> but uh, that's the hope. We can read carefully this working paper and I'm sure it will be, yeah, it, it will be out soon. Yeah, yeah, no, look out for it. <laughs> So Martina, you're, you're referencing, you know, the type of challenges you face working on your on your rules. What would you say are some difficulties or even failures that taught you the most, not just in that, but like in your career? Yeah. Yeah, as a, as a young professional, I was pretty impatient and direct and I tended to assume and jump to conclusions. 
Um, I have found that both on a personal and on a professional level, um, it pays off to listen, to think and consider before responding, uh, to never make any assumptions about what, whatever fact, you know, if it's just uh, who delivers your mail or, you know, something more relevant at your work and to be more diplomatic than direct. Um, and this um, uh, is particularly important in teamwork and in a collaborative uh, environment such as ICSID. And I have learned a lot from my boss, uh, Secretary General Meg Kinnear. Uh, she's terrific and a, a extremely well, eloquent, uh, well-spoken diplomat. And I learned a lot to uh, perhaps say less than more sometimes. Uh, and it's yes, especially, more. yes, exactly. It's not just in fashion, it's also. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I still have difficulties um, with patients in particular sometimes because I'm very pragmatic and I like to things uh, to get things done efficiently. Uh, and it's sometimes challenging when you, when you need to be patient. Uh, but I, I really try my best and I, I think I've, uh, uh, I've become a better uh, deputy just from and manager from from that experience. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and since you've been a tribunal secretary so many times on so many cases, what would you say uh, makes a tribunal secretary a good one? Well, um, our work is very varied. Uh, so it goes from purely logistical and administrative matters to higher level uh, legal analysis. So you have to like mixing the practical aspects uh, with the legal. Uh, it's not like an academic who sits down and, and does research and, and um, uh, drafting um, most of the time. We do a, a lot of mixture of things. And you have to be able to multitask at an extremely high level. Most of our council have about 10 to 15 cases and there are lots of things happening each day. And sometimes there are un unpredicted things and you have to get all of them done. So you need to be extremely organized, uh, have a great sense of detail, have great legal an analysis and drafting, and be prepared to roll up your sleeves and carry boxes when needed. Because sometimes we go to hearings and we don't have anyone to help us with all the material that we needed to to get there. Uh, the best secretaries are usually those who are uh, proactive and anticipate steps to come in the process and are able to quickly advise tribunals on uh, procedural matters in particular. And obviously language skills are also uh, very valuable and important as many of our cases are bilingual. But it's a fine job because it mixes a lot of different aspects uh, and different skill sets. Definitely. Martina, I guess we can ask you the follow up question to that. Mm -hmm. The other side, the arbitrator, what would make the what would make a good arbitrator? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, there's not one answer, you know, one short answer to it. But I would say that a lot of the qualities that I mentioned that I learned through uh, my experience um, are also important for arbitrators. Um, you have to have, uh, the best arbitrators really have to have an open mind uh, to listen to arguments from the parties, but also from the other co-arbitrators with that open mind um, and to take into account you know, to really consider both the law and the facts. Many arbitrators are more interested in the law than the facts, but really uh, you need to consider uh, and be thorough with both. They must be excellent lawyers, of course, but also 
be able to run an efficient and fair process and hopefully also write beautifully. <laughs> really drafting is key. And obviously it is a plus when they also are experts in the subject matter. Uh, so international investment law or any particular industry, if it's banking involved, uh, it always helps with someone who is familiar with uh, you know, banking law. Uh, and believe it or not, calculation of damages. Um, that, <laughs> that is... <laughs> That is a desired skill in all arbitrators. And um, I, I'd say many of them have it now. There's, uh, there's been a, a, a development in that area, um, but that is important as well. I think I learned two new things, write beautifully mm -hmm. and, the, and the calculation yeah. of damages, yeah. <laughs> Very good, thank you. <laughs> and Martina, what would you say is the most valuable lesson that you've learned uh, during your career so far? Well, this is a tough one. Um, as mentioned, I think I learned many lessons and skills during my career, but I think that the most valuable lesson really is that career is not everything. <laughs> Uh, we lawyers work a lot, uh, often too much, and we tend to get sucked into that rhythm and the effect is like a horse with blinders. Um, you don't see what's around you and so you suddenly run, uh, life runs away and, and you're missing things that are important. Um, and it's really uh, difficult uh, to get a good work-life balance in our profession, uh, but we must try and, and we really have to think hard about what matters. And, and each time something tragic happens, such as uh, the passing of uh, Emmanuel Gaillard, uh, I think everybody pauses and thinks about uh, what we're doing and um, whether we should slow down and how to slow down. And it's a big question. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And we've mentioned it before with a few of our guests, uh, the work-life balance is fundamental and we don't talk about it enough and especially to younger lawyers. So thank you for talking about it today. Indeed. And on that note, I gotta hear some funny things from you, Martina. What is the funniest moment you've ever witnessed during a hearing? Well, you know, it's it's uh, the the pandemic has brought about uh, some really funny moments uh, because, as you know, uh, many hearings are now virtual. Actually, all of our hearings have been running virtually uh, for the past year. And now we're kind of, uh, we've gotten the hang of it. We know how it works. Uh, but in the beginning in particular, um, you know, you needed a lot of testing and then a lot of, um, uh, you know, equipment skills, uh, which might not have been the best at all times. So I was in this uh, pretty massive hearing where we had all, everything new including uh, these 360 fisheye cameras, you know, the, oh, the, wow. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that because the, the parties didn't trust each other and their experts and witnesses, and it was uh, important for them that they have a view of the full room and that nobody else was in the room. So you had uh, the, the front camera like this, and you also had a, a camera from the side or some, you know, that show the full room. Okay. Um, and um, that camera was put on by a technician who was sitting somewhere completely different. I mean, all of these people were sitting at home and connecting from home. And uh, the technicians were actually help, helping them to connect. So while the front camera might have been off, sometimes the, the other camera was on. 
-hmm. and uh, while preparing in the morning for uh, for the first witness to come on, I see how that witness is starting to undress <gasps> no. uh, on the 360 camera. <laughs> and of course, there is no sound, so I could not alert that person um, to the fact that, you know, they were uh, <laughs> in full sight. Yeah, well. uh, and the person didn't realize that the, the camera was on. And, and so uh, after some time, we had to sort of try to block the view and, uh, and later on uh, erase from the recording because all of this was recorded, of course. Oh my goodness. Uh, we had to uh, erase that from, uh, you know, future records, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I think 2020 saw a lot of those type of blunders. Oh my goodness, my goodness. But I guess it's those funny moments that actually help us to like take a step back and laugh at ourselves um, when work has us so, you know, in down in the, you know, a funny moment. Like yeah. Bring yeah, it back. <laughs> like, thank you for sharing that. And now, Martina, what advice would you give to young lawyers who want to have a career in arbitration? Well, um, it's, it's a question that I get all the time. And, you know, it, uh, ISDS, investment arbitration, has become such an attractive field of law. And the competition among young lawyers who want to practice in this field is enormous. Uh, I often see young lawyers who want to practice investment arbitration right after law school and they get frustrated when they cannot find a job in the field. And I always advise to first uh, get a broader experience uh, in their own jurisdiction and then specialize. Um, so, in or for, because, you know, in or for it to be good at arbitration, you also need really good overall uh, legal knowledge uh, because you often apply uh, many different laws. And even before that, when you're in law school, uh, I would advise that you think about what you are interested in and what you're good at. And chances are that you're probably good at what you're interested in. Um, and to be honest and self-critical about that, because what's important in arbitration in particular is your drafting skills. Um, all law firms will be looking at that and ICSID as well. Uh, it's really, really important that you um, uh, are a really good writer in investment arbitration and arbitration in general, I would say. And preferably your oral skills should also be good, especially if you're joining law firms. And this is something we, uh, we value at ICSID um, because we're often asked to assist with drafting decisions. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a tough field. It's very, uh, a lot of competition, but uh, if you really want to make it, you should pursue it. There are so many different courses now on the investment arbitration. So you can uh, even specialize uh, while you're in a law firm or um, later on in life uh, and switch to uh, the, this particular field of law. Thank you so much, Martina. It's very helpful. Yeah. So Martina, we're just about out of time, but before we let you go, we have to ask you one more fun question. Uh -huh. I know you're, you're anxious for summer to get to the Caribbean Bahamas. We're looking forward to come for you to come to BBI though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, I've been at the BVI, um, St. John's, a couple of years ago when that huge hurricane, USBI. right USBI. before the... USBI, USBI. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, you were co very close though. Very you were close. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Yeah, so no it's not the same, I know. But the hurricane was the same. <laughs> and it missed us by one week. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm -hmm. wow, wow, wow. 
how how much do you get into Netflix? We need to know what legal show you watch on Netflix. Are you uh, How to Get Away with Murder or The Good Wife? Good Wife, for sure. Ah. But I haven't watched the other one. Maybe I should. Oh, you should. Yeah. yeah. Like immense fan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Absolutely yeah. love Viola Davis. So. Oh, really? Ah. She's great. Then again, I must confess that um, if I were to um, you know, choose between a lawyer uh, series and a non-lawyer series, I would probably pick the non-lawyer. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, which one? Which non-lawyer one then? <sighs> well, I love The Crown. I love oh, The Crown okay, okay, and, yeah. and yeah. those type of series. Yeah, that's a great I'm one. with you on that one. I love that too. Queen's Gambit. Yeah, Queen's Gambit, absolutely. <laughs> See, we have fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Martina. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and Thank more you. what you do. Thank you so much, Martina. Thank you for your time. It was lovely to see you today. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Martina, thank you very much for being our guest today. Yes, thank you so much, Martina, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with us here on Arbitration Life. For more Arbitration Life, please be sure to hit the subscribe button, plus follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook on Arbitration Life. <laughs> uh -huh.